Let's read in Genesis chapter 3 this morning. Last Sunday, we talked about the subject of sin. This morning, I want to talk to you about the subtility of sin. Then after we read in Genesis chapter 3, we'll turn to 1 John and read there. I just want to read one scripture here in Genesis chapter 3, and that is verse number 1. Verse number 1, Genesis chapter 3. Now, the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. So the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which God had made. Now over in 1 John chapter number 1. 1 John chapter number 1. Excuse me, chapter number 2, I'm sorry. My little children, we're reading in verse 1. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. That's the plan of God. He would not ask us to do something that we could not do. Because he'll enable us to do it by the Holy Ghost. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not our sins only, but for, also for the sins of the whole world. <clears throat> Verse 8, again, <clears throat> a new commandment I write unto you, which thing is true in him and in you, because the darkness is past, and the true light now shineth. He, now listen to this. He that saith he is in the light, and hateth his brother, is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. I like verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. What a Savior. Praise the Lord. The subtility of sin. Father, we love you. Anoint again, I ask you, the preaching of your word, Father. Anoint us to receive. Lord, may the Holy Ghost stir and shake and reveal and convict and and help. And may your blood bring a remedy. May our will desire to be open up and be honest with you, Lord, this morning. Uh, Anoint me to preach. In Jesus' name, and the church says with me, amen. I read to you in Genesis one of the most famous and <clears throat> infamous contexts of sin. The Bible said the serpent was more subtle than any creature that God had made. Uh, one writer said that he has a malevolent brilliance, talking of the devil. And what that simply meant, lining up the subtility, it means that he's crafty with creations that come from uh, uh, attitudes of ill will, strife, and hatred that rise up very intense. He's crafty with with all kinds of creations, but behind that presentation of that craftiness is attitudes and actions that are intense based on ill will, and hatred toward you and I. John 10 and 10, Jesus said, The thief cometh not but for to steal, kill, and destroy. So based upon this, we must keep him labeled and identified right. I mean, there's nothing good about the old boy. There's nothing good about what he has to offer. There's no truth in him or his kingdom. So we... We've got to remember, he, he's crafty. He's still subtle. I mean, he can bring creations whereby he is allowed to enter our minds and our hearts and our inner being and begin to promote confusion and dissension and weakness. He's very creative when it comes to hurting people. Young people never forget that about Satan. He's very creative in hurting people. Evil, that's what he is. We must stand on guard from such evil. Now, I'm going to tell you, evil, boy, there's a word. It's a tricky word. 
And the reason it's so tricky is because it can come in, in, in so many various forms and fashions, and it's always covered up. You know, there's just some people that, have, have you got family members that when they're looking at you a certain way and smiling a certain way, you, you start throwing the radar up? Or if there's people that, you know, they come up and, and, and of course, the people that love you and they're being real nice, you think, there's something behind this. Well, when Satan comes up, he's not going to present himself as being such because he knows you know what he represents. All of the forms, the avenues that he approaches us in, he wishes they come unnoticed. I remember Halloween one year when I was a little boy, about I don't remember the exact age I was, eight from eight to ten probably. <clears throat> the, there in the little town of Rolling Fork, everybody went out trick-or-treating that day and uh, or night. Uh, but Dad come in the next evening with a headline of a newspaper. I can't remember whether it was in Vicksburg, Jackson, or Greenville, one of the towns. But somebody that night had slipped razor blades into candy bars. You meant getting those single-edge razors and slipping them in. You know, at night when kids are out there, there and they ripped them off and begin to eat them. And of course, you know what that did to their mouth. But then listen, you think of the evilness. Slipping razor blades in what? Candy. Something that they knew they loved. I tell you what, the, the enemy is crafty. Crafty. What was so dangerous about that? Well, I'll tell you what's so dangerous about that. And this is my first point about the subtility of sin. It's horrible because it's always hid. You think of that. It's a danger about that. I mean, uh, it's hard to see it before its desire of damage is fulfilled. In other words, what have you been preaching on sin for? Preventive care, hopefully. Oh, it's there, but we don't recognize it. The, the evilness of it until it throws its cover off and begins to describe its injury. You've heard the old cliche, you know, alcoholic beverages are advertised so beautiful and desirable. I wish they would let us as a church put billboards up about alcohol. And you know, the nicotine ads, boy, it looks so desirable and, and, and manly and, 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 and picturesque. I wish they would let us put up a billboard of a lung on one side that's been cut open that looks healthy and a lung on the other side that's been cut open and full of nicotine. I don't think that'd sell too many camels, would it? So what are you saying? We must be on guard because we have an adversary that if he ever wanted to trip you and I up, it's in the day and hour we exist in right now. And when he approaches you, he's going to be crafty. He's already got a plan that's set up, been thought through. And as he presents it to you, oh, it's going to be horrible because the essence of it's going to be hidden. And so this morning, I'm preaching to you in a preventive care mode. We must be on guard. Amen. We must try every spirit. We must not be ignorant of his devices, for he is still our adversary. His nature has not changed. He's a roaring lion. He wants to devour you and I, and we must be busy and determined in preventing it. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> There's a neat little article I read the other day about a man who owned a small boa constrictor, and he fed it white uh, mice, you know. Uh, funny thing, uh, th food for thought here. There was a lady in my town uh, when I worked there in Rolling Fork. She owned a, a eight foot boy constrictor. She had a blue Chevrolet van, and I knew it because she'd let that thing go loose in that van while she was driving. She'd come up on her tank full. I'd fill that tank up, but I ain't vacuuming no rug, hon. <laughs> and you know the 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 the, the brothers that work with me. When they'd see that thing pull up, boy, they'd head back to the oil room and say, Gary, you get that. They're scared. They wouldn't want nothing doing carrying a boa constrictor around, you know. 
And so one day I saw her coming way down the road, but instead of turning into the station, she made a left over the bridge, and all of a sudden that van went berserk. She bounced up one side, wham, 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 slammed on the brakes and did a twist and come around, stopped. And out of that van she comes screaming. And I thought, see there, that snake tried to kill that woman. I could just imagine that old boy constrictor wrapped around her neck and her is her, his, 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 uh, biting her nose and, and, and she come running. Oh, Gary, Gary, come help me. I thought, ma'am, you had a uh. <laughs> she said, I said, what's happened, Miss Hamlin? She said, that mouse got a loose in my van. Here she was, wasn't scared of an eight-foot boy constrictor, but the little bitty mouse she had in her box that she'd feed him at church got a loose. And I looked at her and thought, you drunk, aren't you? You got to be drunk. Scared of a little mouse. I thought, Lord, have mercy. I knew whose house I wasn't going to because... I read an article, get back here, uh, about the other day where this man put this little mouse in this glass cage with a small boy constrictor. And, and, and the mouse noticed what was in it. The snake happened to be asleep or whatever. And the mouse noticed the predicament was in, just went frantic. Well, the mouse got to notice and the snake wasn't doing anything. So the mouse did this. Uh, this mouse went to doing away with its problem. You know what that mouse did? It got back with his back feet and started raking the sawdust and the wood chips in that cage. So it completely covered that snake up. Then the mouse act, act like, oh, it's over with. It, it's over with. I, I've covered it up. I can't see it. Therefore, it's a, but you know, sin always shakes its covers off. You know, it, the enemy is a master at convincing us that once it's engaged, we can hide it. We cannot. I don't care what form or fashion it has approached us in. If we get, let the enemy cause us to engage in it, it's there. And it's going to come out. The same person that tempted you to sin is going to be the same person that exposes your sin. He, he's a murderer. He's a liar. And again, I say there's nothing good in him. And I'm talking to us about the subtility of sin. Listen, that snake woke up, shook that sawdust and, and clippings off. And, and became what he was a murderer that mouse was gone in a few seconds I read a cute little story about a, 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 a coach and teacher who was trying to impress upon his students and athletes that sin will kill you and so one day he had them come in a very small room and they noticed why are we huddling in there and he said gather around boys and there was one table right in the midst and they were just shoulder to shoulder of course some of them were pressed right up against that table looking down at it and they noticed here was an old country boy had them big old uh, blue uh, 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 overalls on you know what, what were Big Smith or Big John or whatever and he had his you know John Deere hat on and he was there in his work boots and he had a big old burlap sack under there and they didn't see the sack they just saw him and the coach come in there and, and, and he called the guy's name. I forget what his name was. And, and all of a sudden that big old boy stood up and picked up that sack and dumped out a six-foot rattlesnake on that table. Of course, you do that around Atlanta, Georgia. The coach said that the boys, high school boys, screamed, slapped one another, grabbed one another's hair, yanking for supremacy of getting close to that door. They stomped, they beat, they cried. Finally, they all got outside, and that, that, that old country boy got that snake back in that sack, and threw it, walked on out, and the coach finally said, let's go to another room. And there's all, he said, now look, he said, if that had been cocaine, it would have tempted you to take it. But since there's a rattlesnake you ran from, but he said, I want to remind you, he said, both of them will kill you. I mean, it doesn't matter which way sin comes. It, it's got one aim. It's going to destroy and kill. The thief cometh not. Uh, the, 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 the Greek language signifying this is the only reason. It's, he has a character that it can be no other reason. He comes but for to steal, kill, and destroy. What I'm saying is this. You and I, we've got to steer clear of sin. We cannot allow it access into our minds or our hearts. We cannot give it the most mild 
minute breeding ground. If it does, what will it do? That's the projection. What will it do? It'll take us to a point of complete, complete annihilation. Let's re be reminded of it for what it is. It's nothing. It's death. Eternal death. Where are we today? I want to tell you, sin's horrible because it's usually hid. Uh, it, it's taking you somewhere. And, and the sad thing about this sin is it does not reveal itself before it's done something that's either hard to fix or is irreparable. How many of you remember about the old asbestos situation that come up? You know, people marveled at that <clears throat> material to where uh, you could surround uh, hot pipes or any type of uh, extreme heated element and it would be insulated by that asbestos. But now, uh, 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 at one year's time, that there was over 500,000 people treated with what they would call the asbestos disease. And they said the sad thing about asbestos is this, that when it becomes a medical problem, it's too late to, to fix it. It's there. And, and, and this morning, I, I want to remind you, you know, sin's hid. It, it's similar to asbestos. It will not show up in its reality until it's done something realistically. And that realistic thing is called damage it's called pain and there will be things lost that will be hard to fix and some irreparable altogether I'm trying to tell you it's still sin coming from the same old devil there's nothing good about it I don't care if we're living in the year 2006 I don't care how politicians and I don't care how some preacher would wish to paint it if it's sin it's of hell amen It'll take you to hell. It'll turn your life into a living hell. So what I tell us to do today is this. Be on guard against it. Covered by the blood. Empowered by the spirit. Full of the word. To tell it no, no, no. A thousand times over. The subtility of sin is horrible. It's because it's hid. They say some of the symptoms of asbestos won't come up till 30 or more years down the road. But it always reveals itself. I mean, uh, sin finally wakes up and <clears throat> says, oh, by the way, I've been here. Then it always wakes other people up and says, hey, did you know I was living inside this person? Look what I've done. Isn't it neat? It's a sad day when the world loves to see the demise of their neighbor. That's where sin is. It destroys. Maybe not now. Maybe not now. Yeah, the devil will show you. It's concealed, isn't it? It's well packaged and contained. But, but I'm telling you, if you're determined in it, if you're determined to attach yourself to sin and premeditatively practice it, then one day, eventually, maybe not now, it'll destroy you privately, and destroy you publicly. Why? That's why sin is. We can't, we can't play with it, can we? Probably, listen, and this is an important thought. Probably when you'll be needed the most by others is when sin will destroy you privately, publicly. Mom and dad, you can't afford to play with sin. We can't afford to. You know, we're needed. There's sometimes we might not feel like we're wanted, but we're needed. Amen. Another thing, <clears throat> it's horrible because it's hurtful and it's hateful. Not only he had, uh, I gave this illustration to the kids the other day. In 1986 in the Black Sea, it's what sin can do to our nature. Oh, Brother Norris, I'm not like that. I know you're not, but let's just talk about what we could be so we make sure we're never that. I mean, my grandma was a master artist at getting me to do what she wanted me to do. And she was master at causing me not to do what she didn't want me to do because she had scared me to death. You know, when you're four and five, six years old, out there by a ditch, it kept flowing through. I mean, we had a ditch about, oh, eight feet deep and about, oh, I don't know, nine foot wide coming right by our house, close from here to that wall there. 
and it was before they channeled things. I mean, here would come well, cottonmouth moccasins. There'd be, now it'd be alligators in the midst. My little brother woke up the other day and had a 12-foot alligator right there by his door. Whew. Talk about exciting. Go to the Mississippi Delta for a while. You'll leave quicker than you went. <clears throat> but, I mean, there was all kind of snakes down there. And, uh, you know, being five and six years old, I wasn't eight feet tall. That ditch was eight feet deep. And so she knew that uh, there was fish in there, too. I'm going to tell you what, I dearly loved fish. And, boy, I, I, Mom said, don't get by that ditch, Gary. It was that right there. It was that close. And she's telling me, don't get by it. Grandma said, Gary, you better not get by that ditch because I'm going to tell you what. You see that big willow tree down there? There's a monster lives in that tree. <laughs> and it only comes out at certain times. But if it comes out and you're there by that ditch, he'll come up out of that water and get you. Now, grandmas aren't supposed to lie. <laughs> but she did and did a good job. You know what I'd do? I'd stay away from that ditch. It tormented the life out of me. But I was bound and determined that monster was not getting me. Grandma said that. And she's supposed to have been a good Southern Baptist woman. These two ships off the Black Sea collided. <clears throat> clear, clear day. Hundreds of passengers died in those icy waters. I mean, two ships just, I mean, clear blue, to, boom. So a thorough investigation was put out as of the cause of the accident. Many uh, people that investigated had uh, predetermined opinions that no doubt there was some type of malfunction. It was because of some type of uh, minimal fog on the water. But what they found out it to be, to their horror, was human stubbornness because the two captains would not yield to the other. And because of that assertion of self, neither captain would give way to the other. Each was too proud to yield first. And by the time that they did come to their senses, it was too late. Hundreds of lives was taken because of two men who said, no, I'm not yielding. You move. What are you saying, preacher? I'm saying in every one of us, no matter what our age is, that old self. Right? So, look, you go to a restaurant. They don't cook it exactly like you want it. You'll tell them, I don't like this. It's because of our personality and preference. Nothing wrong with that. I mean, you bring a piece of meat out and you cut it and the cow goes, mmm, take it back. I don't like it like that. And, and I'll ask you, I told you before, but again, for memory, how many flies does it take before you tell them, take it back? We're, we are people of preference. And the enemy can shape that, that, that selfishness Unto where we will not yield. I could be like that. But because I'm perfect, I'm not. I could say I want it my way. And just because of my selfishness, it would bring anxiety and tension on everybody. Now, I know you're not like it, but let me tell you how foreigners are. I'm from Mississippi, so I'm a foreigner. Lord, some people. You see what I'm talking about? The subtility of sin. <laughs> I mean, here's two captains. I'm not yielding. What they forgot was there's a lot more on that boat than just them. <clears throat> I mean, listen, li li listen to me, church. Your home. Would you let a, a robber come in at any space of the night and say, I'm going to take your kids? And you say, okay. No. 
Right now you've got preventive measures set up to where they can't get in. You've got locks on your doors and locks on your windows and no doubt some have alarm systems and, and, and you've got uh, 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 little pieces of metal by your nightstand and other little pieces of metal will come out the end of it and you know, guaranteeing yourself what safety. You're, you're doing everything you can to be ready. You don't want to risk or take any chances uh, that you cannot defend those you love the most. But oh, like I said, evil comes from Satan. Uh, he'll come in in, in another form or fashion and, and you, you, your guards down because it appeals to our carnality, our, our selfishness and, and things will get in our heart. I want to tell you, friend, you can't afford, I can't afford to become so selfish uh, uh, that we, we become murderers just like that's what those captains were labeled as. They were tried as murderers. Oh, if you Listen, if you have something in your heart to where your flesh is growing and flourishing by it, you're not going to be the only one hurt or offended by it. You're going to offend others. You're going to weaken others. You're going to injure others. You're going to hurt others. I'm telling you this morning, a sin in its subtlety is horrible because it's hurtful. It's hateful. And this morning, oh, that we be bathed in the love and humility of our Savior that we do that which is right and beneficial and helpful. Oh, let God arise and his enemies be scattered. God help me to reject sin. But this morning, we can't afford to assert ourselves because that is the breeding, the fertile grounds whereby sin can be developed. Woo! Somebody say, help me, Lord. I'll tell you another thing. It's horrible because it hypnotizes. What do you mean by hypnotizing? They define as a hypnosis as inducing to a state of sleep or sleep-like state so things can be extracted from you. How many of you husbands would like to be able to hypnotize no, Brother Norris. I don't want my wife telling me she wants to kill me. I know that sink in in a minute. Extracting what will not be given by soberness. I, I know you've all heard about uh, the danger of... Is it that boring? Heard somebody yawning. How dare you? Now, everybody wants to yawn. But Jim Elliott, or John Elliott, he was a park ranger in certain areas of the Rocky Mountains, and he just happened to be in southwestern Alberta. And he was getting, given certain zones to inspect, and they were passes. And at this time of year, he had to inspect them because it was a high peak for avalanches. And so they had to be able to tell people if they radioed ahead, which pass can I come through? And they'd be able to tell them. But that day it was exceedingly cold and the wind was blowing uh, extremely hard and pushing that coldness through him. And uh, he was being blasted by blizzards. And so finally he come to his uh, uh, cabin that he was to stay that night. And he had an old St. Bernard dog with him, which had been trained for this. And, and, and John Elliott said that when I went in, I noticed something odd. He said, I laid down in the floor. I didn't even try to light a fire. And I didn't try to get these wet clothes off. And he said the cabin, that air was coming through that cabin. But he said, you know, he said, I just felt like I wanted to go to sleep. And he said, I began to go to sleep. But he said, all of a sudden, that crazy dog started whining and nudging, putting his paw on my face. I mean, a St. Bernard's got a tongue that long. <laughs> and every time you look at it, slobbers drooling. You ever know, you know, just, well, I don't like dogs licking on me. <laughs> and you know, you ever walk by and a dog jump up and nip your finger or lick your hand? I hate that. I can't stand that stuff. I don't like dogs licking on me. But here's this St. Bernard, man. He's just washing him down and nudging him and pawing at him. And all of a sudden, John Elliott said, it dawned on me. He said, I was dying. That dog sensed it and was nudging me back to life. He made this statement. He said, when you're freezing to death, you actually feel warm all over. And he said this, and you don't wake up because it feels so good. Oh, it, it's horrible. 
because it's hypnotizing. I mean, it'll cause you to be put into a sleep-like state and extracting from you the treasures that you need to conceal, especially like spiritual life. Oh, this morning I'm telling you, thank God for all the ways in which the Lord arouses people who are asleep. And he'll send a messenger just like with this simple little message. And here, if you want to lie, say, and you're the St. Bernard this morning, huh, preacher? Call me what you want, but I'm a whine and I'm a nudge and I'm a probe and to remind you that if you're feeling too good in your flesh, you're sleeping the, the sleep of death. Oh, oh, listen to me, church, this morning. Let me nudge you away. Let me stir you. Let me arouse you to an awareness uh, that, that God loves you. Hallelujah. He doesn't want you to sleep the sleep of death. And listen, I want to tell you, listen to this preacher. Sometimes the methods used to awaken people like that are drastic, but always good. Amen. Let us never imagine that because he shakes us, he hates us. No, he loves us. But please, uh, uh, let it be preventive care. Oh, when that sin comes, say no uh, in the name of Jesus. Uh, I don't care what shape or for, fashion or form. It's, it's going to carry you to the same old place. Uh, every other sinner and every other sin winds up. That's death. Oh, accept this nudging this morning to stand guard for you and your family. To stand guard for this church. Can you say amen? And please, please, by the mercies of God, don't play with it long enough to where God has to use drastic measures to awaken our era. I thank God for people getting saved, but I hate to see people have to lose their lives to soften their heart. Say, Brother North, God doesn't do that. Now look, he said it'd be better for you to get up here with one eye and one leg. God's not concerned so much about time as he is eternity. Oh, lethargy. It, it feels good. Psychologists, Christian psychologists tell us that the harboring of bitterness and vengeance feels good. Think of that. Is something lulling you to sleep today? If it is, wake up. Pray up. God's got bigger uses for you than you being destroyed. The methods God has is efficient and effective. No matter the stage they come in, whether it be mild or whether they be drastic. Don't practice those secret sins. Let not me be given to presumptuous sin. Listen, say, Brother Norris, who are you preaching to? I'm preaching to all of us. Because every one of us, this preacher included, has the capacity to open up the door to that which will destroy me sooner or later and my family. Don't be like that old captain. Hateful and hurtful because of his selfishness. And don't be like John Elliott, allowing sin to hypnotize. I close with this. Got to hurry. It, it's horrible because it humors. You think of that. The Bible says there is pleasure in sin for a season. You can actually enjoy it for a while. I remember back in the 80s when John Belushi died. It's before I knew the Lord very long. I remember he was a movie star and he was a severe cocaine and heroin addict. And he died by an overdose of both. There come out in the U.S. News and World Report an article. I didn't read it at this time, at that time, but I've read it here, and and it was talking about the seductive dangers of cocaine. And this one man wrote, he said, "It can, <clears throat> it can do you no harm, but then it'll drive you insane. It can give you status in society, then it'll all of a sudden wreck your career. It can make you lie, uh, make you the life of the party, then it'll turn you into a loner." It can be an elixir for high living, but then it becomes a potion for death. The first stage is to humor, to make you feel comfortable with it, and to make you have a desire for it. 
Everybody likes to laugh, or I'd like to think you do. But I don't like to laugh at the expense of destruction, do you? But the enemy's crafty. That's why you got to be careful what you watch, what you hear, what you say. Because through humor, entertainment, making you feel good, he can plant the process that will not wake up till many years down the road. It, 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 like this writer said, and I feel this to be a good statement, he said, like all sin, there's a difference between the appearance and the reality. Between the momentary feeling and the lasting effect. You see, we need to be reminded of these things about sin. Because in the day and hour we're living in, especially in our culture and our atmosphere, sin is promoted as that which should be desired. But I'm telling you, it's not. There's still a place called hell. And there's still an experience called torment. And that's what sin will bring. Let me see, I've got 16, 17 more points. That was a sniffle of desperation. I heard it. Like, I hope he's joking. Please, Lord. Let me... Sin is horrible because it'll make you not like long preaching. Now, how did you know that was a joke and the one report wasn't? But I close with this. It's horrible because it humors. It, uh, it won't let you see there's a difference between its appearance and its reality. Between the momentary feeling and the lasting effect. It always messes up everything eventually. It hadn't changed its nature. <clears throat> It'll mess up everything eventually. Why are you saying that, Brother Norris? It'll mess up everything eventually. If you hold it, you cherish it, you practice it, you love it, it'll mess up everything eventually. Now, if you're here this morning, you've sinned, and it wasn't because it's your habit, but you fell into it, you've been forgiven, and you've repented, and that God's cut. I'm not talking about this and you. I'm talking about the soul that sinneth shall surely die. You're premeditatedly practicing it, hiding it. That's what the enemy wants you to do. And by chance, if there's anybody doing that, and I pray there's not, and I don't know of anybody doing it. I really don't. <clears throat> but but if by chance you are. First John says, I would that you sin not. But if you do, we have an advocate. Oh. That's the propitiation for all your sins. I don't care what you're doing. I don't care what you're doing. If you're hiding or harboring, there's, there, there's forgiveness. And there's one here today so willing to help you. So, Brother Norris, you kind of made me mad and aggravated me. Why? I haven't really said nothing. Tell me five things that I've specifically named today that's sin. I'm not, but the Holy Spirit is. See, that's why you can't get mad at the preacher, because I didn't say it. I didn't tell you about that. He did. Na -na 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 -na. <laughs> but that's neat when the Holy Ghost personalizes it, because now you know beyond a shadow of a doubt what the Lord wants to deal with you about. It's not just because Brother Norris said. It's because the Holy Spirit right now is bringing you understanding one or two things. Either sin itself or the bridges that you're on that's leading you there. So Brother Norris is tough, isn't it, when God deals? It sure is. Because old flesh enjoys that. But it'll eventually destroy everything. You know why? Because of this little story proves it. I remember the preacher told the story of, there was a little girl that come to children's church. She said, you know, she was that bubbly type, sweetest little thing, cutest little thing. And, boy, she really got saved at a young age. And, you know, she'd come to the altar and she'd pray and cry. And, and one of her greatest prayers is she'd say in such a cute way, Jesus, please save my daddy. I love my daddy so much. 
And that preacher said it wasn't many Sundays that he'd go by that altar and that little girl's praying that day after day. <clears throat> she had asked Daddy, Daddy, come to church with me. And he'd laugh at her and he'd come once in a while. Then when, when he'd come, she'd say right before service, she said, Daddy, come to the altar with me after the preacher's through. And he'd laugh at her and he made fun of that Christian life. He was a very, very successful man. He was a, a man of notoriety. And he just looked at Christianity as something that would harm the view and the presentation he wanted to have of himself in the eyes of others. And uh, she kept on, year, Brother Steve, after year. Daddy, come pray. Come pray. She got older, Brother Minks. Still sweet. But, but finally, when she got old enough, she took, took it all she could take, that rejection. And it was her fault, but she let the enemy start working on her. Finally, she just quit going to church altogether, and her daddy noticed it. She started living around with the wrong people, entered drugs, immorality. And Brother Wade, before it was over with, she was so destroyed by the power of sin. When her daddy saw her one day, he was so overwhelmed that he went that day and got the preacher. And he went down to the same place that little girl prayed and asked the Lord to forgive him and save him. And he did. Gloriously saved him. He left that place and went out and found his little girl. And through tears, kneeling, begging her, come get saved. I'll go back with you and pray at that same spot. And he begged and he pleaded. He said, all of a sudden, he stood up, and he, he had her hand in his hands, and she said, all of, he said, all of a sudden, she broke out in eerie, hilarious laughter. And said, Daddy, you've waited too late. From the time that article was written, I haven't heard if she's ever returned. But I'm telling you, that's sin. There's sin in its package. It'll destroy everything eventually. And this morning, I'm so thankful that Jesus, oh, what a Savior. He's trying to cut things and scenarios like that off. He's trying to intercept hearts. And he's putting up red flags saying, this is sin, stay away from it. You know why? Because of the deep love of God. We've been created for His good pleasure. And that's what He wants upon us, good pleasure. I'm telling you this morning, oh, make a commitment to Christ. Give me the strength to keep rejecting sin, Lord. And you know what He'll do? He'll do that. But this morning, my heart's been burdened for a couple of weeks just on the subject of sin. More subtle than any creature he'd ever created. I believe that to be true. By the word, first and foremost, by coming face to face with the source of this creature. I've got an adversary. What about you? But more than that, now I've got a Savior. Now I have a Savior. And I am persuaded to believe that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Wonderful Jesus. Protecting us from the subtility of sin. <laughs> Father, we love you. Oh, Lord Jesus. Help us, Lord, to stay pure. Oh, Lord Jesus, keep your hand upon us and help us. Oh, wonderful Jesus. Lord, deal with our hearts and our minds this morning. Stir a stronger desire to want to please you. To be heavenly minded. Keep our hearts, Lord. And this morning I pray you deal with them. Deal with us strongly in the sense of helping us. And Lord, help people make decisions this morning. Help us all to make decisions, Lord, to, to live godly and soberly. 
This is a day of an untoward generation. Seeding things that is going to grow into terrible, terrible destructiveness, Lord. But Lord, thank you that we don't have to be part of that crowd because your blood has cleansed us and forgiven us and your spirit's keeping us and empowering us. So Lord, help us to want what's right. And that can only come from you, Father. This morning, help us and deal with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Right there where you're seated, please, no one looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you. I'm not. Embarrassment and humility just is provoking. This morning, have you noticed maybe sin or at least the projection unto its temptation has been coming around too often, too close? If you're there, there's a reason for it. It, it, It's probably because the enemy has determined a season to visit you. Just like he did Jesus, Elijah. And I'm going to ask you a question. What are you going to do? You can't afford to cave in. I've tried to tell you in in a very weak manner this morning. It's nothing to play with. But it's so seducing. But this morning as we're closing in prayer, is the Holy Ghost helping your heart today? Let it sink in. Brother, sister, there... We've come too far. God's been too good to us. And there is things in the future that we will experience if we stay faithful. It's just the enemy tempting you. He would love to see you disqualified from the present and future blessings of God that you so are going to delight in. Don't let him do that to you. Don't let your flesh do that to you. But let's ask God to re-empower us to desire that which is holy and pure. But if you say, preacher... I'm afraid uh, this just got to quit, Brother Norris. The devil, I know, Brother Norris, right now I'm in a season where the devil is after me. And again, Brother Norris is not saying you've caved in. I'm not saying that, friend. But you recognize there's a season the enemy's really working on you with. Temptation is readily accessible. If you want to go that way and you feel him reaching in and Brother Norris, is, it's just a kind of scary time right now. I don't know why he's around me in my home like this. I can tell you why, friend. He hates you. But if you'll say, Brother Norris, I want you to pray for me because I think I'm in this season. And Brother Norris, I, I, I'm telling you in my heart, I don't want to engage in this sin. And with the help and grace of God, I'm not. But I just want you to pray for greater protection. And I'm making a public show to the Lord and to you, Brother Norris, that, look, I'm going to stay clean. But if you're here and the enemy's coming around with a tough season, would you slip up your hand with humility, confessing that under your help? Yes. See that hand, that yes. Others, don't be ashamed, friend. This preacher has seasons that bother him too. It reminds me I have an evil adversary. Any other brothers, sisters, say, preacher, oh boy, he's coming around. Real quick, don't be ashamed. Be honest. Yes. Other hands. Yes. I'm telling you, church, the enemy, he's trying everything to destroy this church. And not only this church in the present, but the experience that God has us destined to in the future. Don't let it happen. Anyone else like to raise your hand before we pray? Oh, friend, this morning, whatever it takes to leave here with God, do it. Do it. Hallelujah. Tell you what, let's find us a place to pray and talk to the Lord about this sin. Talk to the Lord about how this adversary and ask the Lord to empower you with desires of purity. Let's pray, church. The subtility of sin, it's horrible.
sisters I need him to help me just let him build you up strengthen you